Thanks, Emily, and thank you, all of you, for being here with us this evening at Old South Meeting House. So um, just a few days from now, on Saturday, we will be uh, marking 250 years since a very important meeting happened in this space. Um, but we still use the space to convene people in dialogue about history, about its legacies, about how it relates to the challenges that we face in our uh, country today. Um, and in our democracy. I'm, and I'm so delighted to be here with you um, to share this program, this conversation with you. So our program tonight is about uh, Dr. James Victor's new book, T, Consumption, Politics, and Revolution, 1773 to 1776. And we're just really delighted that he chose um, to be with us as part of a tour of uh, different places that he has been on uh, the last several weeks to talk about this important new book and a beautiful uh, book it is as well. Um, so this uh, lovely book reveals a new dimension to the Boston Tea Party by exploring a story largely overlooked for the last 250 years, the fate of two large shipments of East India Company tea that survived and were drunk in North America, were not tossed into the harbor on that fateful night of December 16th, 1773. So um, Dr. Fichter's book challenges the prevailing wisdom around the tea protests and consumer boycotts and shows the economic reality behind the political rhetoric of the era. Colonists did not turn away from tea as they became revolutionary Americans. So history records the noisy protests and the prohibitions of patriots, uh, but the merchant ledgers and other behavior um, that is unpacked in this lovely book uh, reveal that tea and British goods continued to be widely sold and consumed. So we're gonna talk more about that this evening, but first I wanna introduce our uh, guest this evening, Dr. James Fichter. Uh, he is an associate professor of European and American studies at the University of Hong Kong, so he's come a long way to be with us this evening. He teaches courses there on maritime history and the revolutionary Atlantic. Dr. Victor is also the author of So Great a Prophet, How the East Indies Transformed Anglo-American Capitalism, and the editor of British and French Colonialism in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, Connected Empires Across the 18th to the 20th Century. His next monograph, Suez Passage to India, Britain, France, and the Great Game at Sea, 1798 to 1885, examines the interconnections between the British and French empires in Asian waters from Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798 to the Sino-French War in 1885. Dr. Fichter received a BA in History and International Studies from Brown University in 2001 and a PhD from Harvard University in our backyard here in 2006. So Dr. Fichter, please come on up and join us. Great, so just a note about our format. Um, uh, so uh, we are going to um, instead of uh, do a formal lecture, we thought it might be easier um, if we could open up the book by having a bit of a conversation. So I'll be uh, sitting here and leading a discussion with Dr. Fichter to explore the work and its significance, and we're gonna make sure that we leave plenty of time at the end for uh, questions from the audience. That's those of you in the room here, but we also have uh, folks who are watching online um, through our partners at the GBH Forum Network. Thank you so much. Um, and we know that there will also be folks viewing this um, in the future on uh, C-SPAN, who's also uh, recording the event tonight. So we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, we're gonna conclude a little bit after seven o'clock and we invite all of you who are here in the room to stay for a drink and a, a bite to eat and to talk with the author. There are copies of the book that you saw as you came in um, and there'll be an opportunity to buy one of those and get it signed um, by Dr. Fichter. So um, please do stick around when we're done. All right, so without any further ado, I'm gonna sit here, we're gonna take our uh, uh, our little uh, podium away so it's not in the way of the cameras, and we'll get started. Um, so I thought, um, James, if I may, uh, that um, we might just start off 
by inviting you to tell us what led you to this project um, and help us understand what you see as the contribution that it makes to our understanding of revolutionary America um, and the events that happened in this room 250 years ago. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think I came to the project through a bunch of slow realizations along the way that things I thought were true were wrong and little statements and footnotes weren't right. And then the mistakes and sometimes the lies just kept on adding up piece by piece until it seemed like a mountain. And I realized I needed to work on it as a topic. I think what struck me most was looking at newspapers that had big essays in them about how we're never going to drink any more tea. Tea is terrible. It's the worst thing ever. And in the same newspaper, one column over is a tea advertisement. And I just, I really struggled with that. And I thought, well, how can I be the first person to have noticed that? What does this mean? How do I draw anything from that? And it slowly built from there. So there's a little, you have a little bit of a Mythbusters instinct there. You, you saw things that didn't add up. You, you saw the, the arguments that were made about the time period and in the time period and started digging. So what were some of the key sources that opened the story up for you in fresh ways? Yeah, I, in, in the digging process, it's exactly it. There was a lot of myth and also just overt propaganda at the time. I, one of the key sources was newspapers and was the realization that um, I think often sco historians, scholarly historians, and, and non-scholarly historians both take uh, newspapers too literally, that, uh, that were descriptions that read like reporting of an event that people saw or attended. Um, those aren't, they, they, don't, they have a verisimilitude that's um, misleading. And uh, they've been heavily edited, they've been heavily, heavily rewritten, or simply cooked up uh, to describe an event in a different way. Um, uh, and so that happened often enough, and then, of course, this was very useful because newspapers would um, print each other's news copy. So one newspaper runs a story in Massachusetts, and a newspaper in Virginia or South Carolina runs it. And while other Bostonians might know, well, that's not exactly how it happened, no one in Rhode Island, let alone Virginia, would be able to indict that account, and so it became the reality as a result. And so there was this I began to realize there was this slurring epidemic, basically, of press releases that were happening in the news from patriot leaders. Um, and I started to pull on those. Uh, and then I really started getting into the merchant accounts and merchant ledgers that revealed such a different story. That's great. Um, so uh, we're sitting here in Old South Meeting House, right? Um, and I think most Americans. Um, at some point in their lives, learned a thing or two about the events that happened here in 1773. We have this idea of the Boston Tea Party um, that has been shaped and reshaped over time. Um, and you've given us an account that helps us understand, um, that helps correct some of the impressions that seem to have taken hold in our popular memory over time. Um, so one of the, I think one of the ideas that many of us carry is that the actions that happened on that night in December of 1773 were sort of acting upon a consensus in the town um, that the tea should be destroyed, that uh, tea was the um, was an artifact of this imperial struggle that should be resisted. Um, but uh, you maybe don't see it quite that same way. Um, so I want to ask you two questions. One, um, help us, can you help us understand um, what folks uh, in this room or in the town of Boston might have thought about the tea uh, at that time in December of 1773, but also, what is it like to be picking it away, picking away at our, at an at an important national myth? Have what has the experience of being a scholar working in this vein been for you? Well, to answer the second question first, the experience has been very weird because I'm a scholar that lives in another country, and so I'm often trying to figure out what um, what you people here are still thinking about it because I don't live here. So it is there's a certain distance to it. But then just walking by yesterday. I heard a, a tour guide outside at the burying ground uh, uh, talk, giving, talking about this, that, and consent, and some other things that seemed very 
cooked up to me. And so I thought, well, I'm on the right track. There's still, there's still a lot of debunking to debunk. Um, but so to this consensus question you mentioned earlier, definitely you know, the moment of the T-ship's arrival was uh, a peak moment in the political contest in Boston. Uh, and it was a peak moment because, uh, because Boston patriots, the Sons of Liberty, as well as the more polite, um, uh, accept politically acceptable leaders that presented the clean face of the patriot movement to the public. It's, uh, it's useful to think of them in this divided sort of element. You've got sort of a Sinn Féin type, type, and then you've got the IRA underneath them, both agitating toward the same goal, but the, the clean-cut politicians and the, the paramilitary types underneath them. And in, in Boston, Boston patriots had really struggled. In the previous several years, uh, after the end of the last boycott, uh, when all, up and down the colonies they had agreed we will we'll stop our boycott of other British goods, but we'll continue our boycott of tea. They were supposed to continue. Well, New Yorkers and Philadelphians managed this quite successfully. Bostonians, like Virginians, like Carolinians, uh, completely failed and ended up consuming and importing large amounts of tea in 1771 and 1772. In 72, I think about 40% of all the tea that came to North America dutied British tea, originally purchased in London from an auction from the East India Company and brought here by private merchants. 40% of that was, was just coming to Boston. Um, and that, that says that patriots had to have been quite anxious about getting people to subscribe to these political ideas they had about consuming things. Because obviously, lots of people didn't subscribe to these ideas. And they demonstrated that every day when they bought consumer goods that they weren't supposed to buy. And the arrival of this India Company T pre presented the possibility of being a final blow in pushing Bostonians into more broadly accepting this arrangement. Um, so particularly around this, the tea tax, which we probably all know, this tax that Parliament was putting on tea, it had been in place for years. There was no, um, no real concern about uh, establishing a precedent of the tax being in place. It had been in place for half a decade already, uh, and Bostonians had been paying it. Um, but the, the other problem that patriots had was this issue of consent. So if, if you don't consent or if you don't want to pay this tea tax, there's a great way to do it. Just don't buy any tea. Problem solved, right? The tax is not a, a tax that everyone has to pay all the time. It's a tax that's levied on the goods when they're imported and then passed on to the consumer only if he buys it. And so the easiest way to solve this problem is just to tell people, don't buy any tea or just don't buy any duty tea. That'd be the simplest solution. The least amount of work, the least amount of trouble. But they obviously knew they couldn't really get away with this, that this wouldn't work. And so, the real problem was, was that they, it was that too many people actually did consent to taxation without representation. It wasn't really a big problem for them. They were happy to pay the tea tax and that this was their real problem. So what they needed to do was act like a government that imposed its will on everyone in a law, whether you like it or not, you have to obey it. And so this is what the Tea Party was, forcing everyone to not consume it, whether they consented to consume it or not. So um, you're really looking at uh, two layers of change that are interacting with each other, right? Over a long period of time, there are changes in um, consumption that are bound up with consumer behavior that are really an artifact of culture as it was being shaped in the British Atlantic world. And then you've got another layer that is the politics that governs consumption, which intersects with an imperial crisis that is reaching a sort of critical impasse. Is that right? Yeah. So um, I know that your work is really focused on a, a, this really critical inflection period in the 1770s, but for our audience who, who may be just beginning to think their way into these issues, help us understand what the arc of that the sort of behavioral uh, piece looks like. What, how does tea become a favored drink in the colonies? Um, and uh, you know, how deeply entrenched is it in people's lives by the time we get to the 1770s? Okay, it's a, it's a great question. So if you look at someone like Benjamin Franklin, who was fairly old by the time of the Boston Tea Party, 
um, and, and, and no longer in Boston. But uh, uh, you look at the arc of his life. People in the 1720s didn't have nice things. Uh, there weren't many nice things they could afford to have. If you look at the material culture of how everyday people lived, um, the level of furnishings in homes were quite low. The amount of uh, imported consumer goods that people could eat or drink were not very much. But this built up over time, over the 50 years that followed by the time of the 1770s, is this growing uh, consumer culture that North American colonists, the British colonists North America can engage in. Uh, it's about having nicer furniture, imported furniture, perhaps even from elsewhere if you're wealthy, but proper tables and chairs and cabinets and cupboards that their ancestors may not have had. It may simply have been a, a stool and a table, it may have been a, a, a some sort of a, a half-made bed, it may have been all that they had. Um, uh, newly made uh, linens and sheets that could have been woven in a mill in, in Lancaster rather than Lancastershire in England, rather than made at home. Uh, you can be having uh, imported drinks, Madeira, coffee, tea, um, in greater amounts than your father or your mother or your grandparents could have. And so the problem, one of the problems of the, the boycotts in the 1770s is it's saying, now that we can have nice things, you can't have nice things. And, and life is still a bit nasty, a bit brutish, and a bit short in the 1770s. And so it's these nice things that make it endurable for people. And so it's hard to take them away. Right. Yeah. I, I often, we, as we, we do, a, we meet a lot of visitors to our sites, the old South Meeting House and the old State House every year, um, who come here to learn about the revolution. And I find, uh, I, I often have to remind visitors that the revolution is only a, a part of people's lives, right? They're living full lives. They're navigating the day-to-day -day of, um, of their family's activities and their community's activities. And um, it's not all politics all the time even though the, the noise of politics is outside all the time. Um, so uh, we had a little hint of how that, the, the tension between that political layer and the cultural piece might have intersected here in Boston, but Boston is not all of North America, right? Much, I mean, I hate to break it to all of us who are here in Boston, but there are other colonies out there. Um, you, you start the book with a chapter that's titled um, The Tea Party That Wasn't, which is about what happened down in Charlestown, South Carolina, um, because tea ships went to many different ports, right? Um, so can you just give us a little bit of a glimpse of how things may have played out differently in other places? What happened in, in South Carolina? Yes, I mean, Boston was very strange. It was the only city that had a big fight over the tea that it couldn't resolve. All the other places the tea ships went, they found a resolution. Some sort of coming to terms between the local customs officials, the, the governor, the tea merchants that were set to receive it, and the Sons of Liberty and the Patriot Organization. In South Carolina, the tea ship arrived. Uh, Christopher Gadsden and the Sons of Liberty campaigned against it. And, and um, uh, they had a huge meeting in the Exchange, which was this large building uh, that housed the Customs House facilities on the ground floor, and above was the main meeting hall. It served the same political purpose as this Old South would. Um, and they resolved that they were definitely going to not let the tea in. And while all the uh, firebrands and politicians were yakking away upstairs in the Great Hall of the Exchange, uh, South Carolina merchants unloaded dutied British tea off of the ship that had these India Company tea. So not the company's tea, but other private parcels of dutied tea. Paid the duty at the customs house underneath, while the politicians are still talking upstairs, put them in carts and carried them to their shops and offered them for sale. And the, the talking uh, politicians only worked this out several days later. Um, so this was not the greatest success. And then they went around after this meeting and started asking merchants to sign a boycott, saying, or sign a pledge that they wouldn't sell duty tea. And the merchants kept on finding ways not to be at the shop when the campaigners came by or to say, well, come back tomorrow. I, I haven't really made a decision yet. And they, they did their best. And then um, they did what all people do when they want to throw a spanner in a public meeting. They then cast doubt on what the previous meeting had even agreed to do, right? This is this is what you do when you want to mess up your school board meeting, right? You do exactly like that. So that's what the merchants did. And eventually, uh, uh, despite all their struggles, they met, uh, the Patriots in South Carolina 
held on. They got the agreement not to have the tea ship land, tea landed, uh, but and for the local merchants to wash their hands of it, which which happened. Um, but the merchants couldn't send the ship back, and so the customs collector seized the tea after the 20-day deadline, the exact sort of 20-day deadline that the Boston Tea Party was trying to avoid happening. He seized the tea, he impounded it for non-payment of the duty, locked it up in the exchange, and it stayed there without any trouble, right? The, the, in Boston, they were worried that if they locked it up in the, in the King's Customs Warehouse, that it would then be broken open and people would steal the tea or that merchants would unload it and sell it to the public. But in South Carolina, they managed to come to a term, some sort of terms with the customs collector. I suspect, as in many of these ports, what happened is you, the merchants, many of them patriotic, would offer a bit of a bribe to the customs collector. And, and so he knew how this job worked. He knew he had to come to some sort of modus vivendi with them and they with him. So he impounded it and he never offered it for sale. And it was the problem was solved. No conflict, no struggle, no tears, no revolution. Well, uh, a good reminder that the whole world was not Boston mm. <laughs> in the 1770s, right? Um, but even in Boston, uh, events happen that um, are not consistent with the memory that we have kept of this moment. You spend uh, a little bit of uh, energy trying to chase down the fourth tea ship, right? Which yeah. doesn't make its way into the harbor. Tell us a little bit about the story of the William and why it matters. The William is a fascinating story. So the, um, the East India Company had hired or has shipped its tea on four separate ships, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, the Beaver, and the William. And they arrived in, they arrived in Massachusetts in that order. And uh, three of them arrived in Boston properly, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver, fine. The William hit a storm and wrecked off of Cape Cod, and it wrecked on December 11th. Now, uh, that could have been the end of it. Uh, it's hard to imagine that crates full of tea are gonna survive a shipwreck. Uh, it would have been a tea party already, you'd think. But it wasn't, uh, the, ship's, the ship's cargo was salvaged. Uh, and so one of the East India, the merchants tasked with the, handling the East India Company's affairs in Boston, we call them the consignees, one of the consignees got on his horse and rode out to the Cape and, and sorted this out. Um, he found some men to salvage the tea and he paid them in tea from the, the Williams consignment to, for their labor, which was no small feat and potentially quite a dangerous job to be salvaging this off of the rocks where the ship had wrecked, and of course rocks and waves in a storm are, are dangerous places. Uh, so he paid them in tea, and then after several days he finally found another uh, ship captain dumb enough to take the tea on board and bring it into town. Um, and then he brought it to Castle William, which is now Fort Independence here, um, and which was then a freestanding, on a freestanding island uh, in the harbor. Uh, and so he didn't bring it into Boston town itself. He didn't bring it up to Griffin's Wharf. He knew better than that. And the result was that he got it lodged in the castle safely under lock and key again of the customs officials. They seized it, they impounded it, they had the key for it, but then their room was now in a castle that was defended by the 64th Regiment that was surrounded by stone walls that was surrounded by an ocean that had the Royal Navy in it. So it was much more secure than the King's Warehouse in town. And it stayed there for the next several, for the next year and a half. And for the longest time, I could not figure out what happened to it, and no one had figured out. I think most people assumed it disappeared because um, the British blew up the castle when they evacuated in March of 1776. And so if the tea, wasn't, if the tea were still there, then it would have just been blown up. And so there was, there was a real possibility of that, and I kept on digging, trying to find out what happened. I thought, oh, it just if I can't find anything, the, the best guess is it, boom. So, but then eventually, uh, after checking everything, after checking military records and checking private correspondence and this and that, on a lark looking for something else, I was looking through, of course, the East India Company records. And there, not for 74, where everyone looks, but from 1775, where no one bothered to check, there was their record of receiving payment for the tea from the William after it had been sold in Boston. It was sold when Boston was, had been liberated by the British uh, from Patriot rule and where British, where British loyalist Massachusetts, Massachusetts had evacuated from the rest of the countryside and fled into Boston. So the city population had collapsed from about 13,000 to two or 3,000 people, plus the Royal Navy uh, personnel and the soldiers. 
But these people were now free from patriot government, and the patriots in the countryside were free from the loyalists, so they had both gotten rid of each other. And now, in this market, suddenly, there were consumers who would buy it. And so that's when it finally got sold. That's such a great story. Um, and I want to invite you just to take a moment uh, to tell us what that felt like personally to find those records, right? Because that's not something that happens all the time, right? Here's something that nobody else has been able to chase down. You've spent a ton of time looking for it. You've given up the search, and then you stumble across it in a place where you weren't expecting to find it. That must have been amazing. It was, and it was very anticlimactic, too, because the, the clerk that wrote down the note didn't know that I was going to care. And so it was just a, a prosaic giveaway line or two in this big ledger. And I think also, annoyingly, the, the, it was in this minutes book of the East India Company director's uh, uh, meetings, and they had lost the, the index at the beginning. Everyone was too lazy to read the thing because it's like a thousand pages long. So what you do is you just look under A for America or Agents in America, and you go to the pages that have been very carefully indexed for you, and you just read those. But the A was missing, and so like everyone skipped it because it wasn't worth doing. So I just thought, well, I have a day. I'll just read this whole thing, and I found it, and so there it is. Kudos to you. That's amazing. Um, all right, I want to come back to uh, the tension between the culture and the politics of tea consumption. Mm -hmm. um, you have a very provocatively titled chapter called uh, Tea's Sex, mm -hmm. um, which explores uh, women's place in both the, the culture of tea consumption and the politics of it. Um, tell us a little bit of, more about that. I mean, was was drinking tea heavily feminized in this moment, or is this a moment where views of its the sort of gendering of tea consumption changes? Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, yes, to both. Um, so we have no evidence whatsoever that men or women drank tea at different amounts, right? There's no proof that women drank tea more or men drank tea left, less. But we kind of had this American cultural assumption that tea drinking is a somehow slightly feminine activity. And I can never quite put my finger on it, and a lot of people will say, no, not really. But then some will nod their heads, as I see you're doing, and yes, I've heard this, I, I sense this, people will say. It's certainly not the case in England, or, or, or I think in Canada. So, um, so one thing that I, I sort of notice is first, we can't really prove there was a difference in consumption. Uh, what we do know, what really mattered in terms of a difference, was that in terms of formal serving tea in a polite formal setting, a woman would usually be in charge uh, of serving the tea at a tea table, hence the, the British expression, who will be mother who will pour the tea, right? Uh, but that's, uh, that suggests uh, female leadership, not necessarily um, female like demographic dominance of tea drinking. So this reflects female leadership in the domestic space of the household at home. This reflects a woman's decision making to, about what consumer goods to buy at the shop. And so you will find, if you look at merchant ledgers, very rarely do women's names appear as the consumers of goods because they're buying it under their husband's accounts. And so you, know, you, you wouldn't have, um, your name would appear even if your, your spouse goes and buys the tea. Okay. So actually, women are making all these consumer decisions. And so women's decision to support a boycott by not buying tea actually becomes a very important element of the story. And on one level, it's very attractive for us as historians to find see a way in which women can be engaging in politics, right? They're making these decisions. But at the same time, it definitely gets heavily gendered because patriots start writing all these uh, poems and jokes and essays and stories about women giving up tea. And the general gist they have of it is something on the lines of, of course, uh, often they'll write in, a male will write in as a woman under a female surname, and he'll say, well, you know, I, I'm just a weak-willed woman and I can barely control my feelings or my emotions, but, you know, even I've managed to give up tea. So what, it, what does that say to you men who still drink it? Um, so they were just basically cucking other people into giving up tea, um, and to say it crudely. And uh, so that was, that's political activism, right? That's propaganda. That's not reality of how people actually behaved or drank. Um, 
Right, uh, and it, but it, it begs the question, um, I, I wonder if we can um, invite you to, to share a little bit of um, your thinking about boycotts in general, right? I, I imagine, um, I mean, these questions about who polices consumption and purchasing decisions and that sort of thing have come up over, over in many different uh, circumstances across time, and you've probably thought about those. So um, what are your thoughts about whether boycotts are successful? Um, what are your thoughts about what it takes to make a successful boycott? Um, and how can you help us understand this period in the larger sweep of this kind of uh, political movement across time? That's a big question. It is. Sorry. So, like, part of the thing is the boycotts are often confused with prohibitions or sanctions. A boycott would be a voluntary solicitation of people to not do something, right? Whereas a prohibition, like the prohibition on alcohol, is a government ban that, you, that you're, it doesn't invite you to join. It mandates you join. And, and so it bleeds, these two issues bleed into each other. Um, there's one boycott in the American, well, one one government ban in the American Revolution we never consider as such, and that is the, the Boston Port Act, which was basically the British government putting sanctions on the town of Boston until it conformed to some other event. And that act was a complete disaster because it didn't provide any end date. It just said the, the port of Boston is closed until Boston pays or Massachusetts pays for the tea. And if Massachusetts never pays, the port will stay closed forever. Now, that's clearly untenable. You need to have some sort of, it'll be closed for 30 days as a punishment. That would have been a much more functional way, because then you can declare victory and be done after 30 days. Whereas if you have a boycott, that's, if you have a, a closure of the port and you say, oh, and it'll stay closed until you pay, then basically that gives the decision making about when this conflict ends over to the other side. And that's often true with boycotts, right? If you're boycotting something and uh, uh, you declare that your boycott is to last in perpetuity until there is a change in policy of whatever it is you're boycotting, then all the real decision-making is now on the other side about whether they will change their policy to adapt to your requests. And boycotts as voluntary actions are very tiring. People are not necessarily, as motivated as they may be on day one or day 30 or day 100, are going to be a lot less motivated on year three uh, or year five to carry on with a boycott. Sometimes they will be, but they need to be continuously spurred on, continuously encouraged and renewed in their energy and vigor. It needs constant revival. And that is hard. And so boycotts have sort of a natural decay that goes on to them. And this boycott, so in the American Revolution, after the, the Boston Tea Party, eventually the Continental Congress declared that they would ban trade with Britain and ban the consumption of tea, so a ban, not a boycott. Um, and this, this, uh, and this uh, ban that they declared, uh, eventually everyone started violating it so much that it was completely untenable, and they ended it. But it was not politically embarrassing because they had moved on. By the time they ended it, the war was well, well ongoing, and it mattered a lot more uh, whether you fought at Bunker Hill than it did about what you drank afterwards. And so that boycott collapsed, but it didn't cause any problems because the tensions had moved on. Well, if you don't have something else to distract people from after the boycott, then it can be quite embarrassing. And the previous boycotts of the seven, early 1770s had collapsed for exactly under that reason. So I mean, it's striking how hard it is to make them work. I think the best example of a boycott that worked well that I can think of is the Montgomery bus boycott. That's a boycott where the consumers, the people that bought bus tickets, were right there locally impinging on the, the, the bus company's business by not driving that. And they could see whether it was working day by day. When you have boycotts that are far away, where you're boycotting another country, or boycotting a large corporation with a headquarters thousands of miles away, it's much harder to have any real impact. I think for to be at best, it has to be local so that it can have real, real impact. That's, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and I think the point about it being local um, is, is, is very astute. 
Um, but there was, of course, even even in the, the boycotts of the 1770s, where there's an ocean mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a wide scale, um, there are local dimensions, yes. right? So um, you are uh, in your town or in your neighborhood, you are arrayed uh, with a variety of uh, different opinions. Um, and so tell us a little bit about uh, some of the examples you uncovered of people's behavior trying to navigate the calls or the bans uh, on the behavior uh, that was consuming tea. Um, how did people navigate that if they chose not to abide by the call to not consume tea? Um, uh, how did they um, make the case for drinking tea mm. in ways that would not redound to them politically? Well, there were, of course, there were a lot of people who just sort of said one thing and did another because to join the, the, the association, as everyone was asked to do, um, uh, someone would go around town with, with a sign-up sheet and you would sign to your pledge that you would support this. And of course, when you looked at the sheet and you saw that your neighbor had just signed, you realized that your other neighbor down the road was going to see whether your name was on the list or not on the list because you're free to not sign, but we'll all know you didn't sign and we'll boycott you for not signing, so you're, you're not really free not to sign. But, so you, you, you just sign, but then no one checks. There's no police checking you in your house. Loyalists put out lots of scare stories about how there will be people going around to people's houses checking what they do. No, no. Patriot leadership was quite clever, right? They said, you know, sign this, and we're not going to ask any questions about what you actually do because we're too smart for that. We're going to just take your pledge at its word and not really follow up on it. As long as you agree to the concept that we're in charge, we really don't care what you do at home privately and quietly. But then if people needed to buy more tea, that could be a problem. So one thing they did was they would go to Patriot leaders and say, I need special permission to buy some tea. And one of the best ways to do that in the boycott was to say, <clears throat> I've, I'm sick, and so I need a special medical permission to get tea. I mean, I know it's against the rules, but I'm sick, so I need some tea. And we see these. There are a number of these that survive from Connecticut, little permission slips, individual cases. We see them from Virginia, from uh, North Carolina, from South Carolina, from Maryland. These are widespread uh, that people throughout the colonies, without any coordination, all knew that they could ask for medical permission and right, that it would be sufficiently plausible to people because tea was thought to be vaguely somehow medicinal, apothecaries would stock it in their shops. Um, okay, you can, have, you can have some tea. Sure, you can have a quarter pound, you can have half a pound. And then they worked out that the best thing to do was to get medical permission uh, uh, in another town so that they wouldn't know, the people in your town might know you weren't sick. So you would go to the neighboring town and ask for permission there and they wouldn't know you. And then you would get the tea from a merchant there. Sounds vaguely familiar <laughs> to recent uh, consumption uh, debates. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, there's, a, there's a lot we can find in the past that helps us understand the present in new ways, right? Um, I, uh, can we come back to the Boston Tea Party, given mm -hmm. where we are sitting? Um, and um, so we talked earlier about how um, things play out differently in South Carolina. Um, we've talked a little bit about how our understanding of what happened in Boston um, is not really what happened. Um, we've, we've mistaken that memory in some way. Um, can you help us understand why we've ended up with this myth that surrounds the Tea Party? Um, when, when does that take shape and, um, and how can it help us to, to to read your book, to, to have this information as we navigate this moment of sort of uh, remembering. Mm. It takes shape in waves. And the first wave is in 1774, right after the Boston Tea Party. So um, the Tea Party is inadequate. They only destroy three of the four cargoes. Uh, but it is also excessive because many colonists in Boston, uh, even some in Boston and many outside Boston, including noted people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, disapproved of the violence of the Tea Party itself. They preferred a more peaceful solution as it happened in New York or Philadelphia, where they just got the ships to turn around, or in South Carolina. And so 
it was very divisive in early 1774 about how people felt about it. Even patriots were quite concerned about the Tea Party. And you can see descriptions of the Tea Party from patriot leadership that sounds a lot like what Governor Hutchinson was saying about it, uh, patriot leaders in other colonies, uh, because they found it quite distasteful. But then uh, uh, what happens is this fourth cargo is stuck in Castle William. And it's not landed for sale, but it could be landed at any time. And of course, there is the problem that the Bostonians were particularly noted drinkers of taxed tea. And so landing it might find, it, landed tea like this might find sale, and it might be a problem. And so it needs to be kept out. And so this forces Boston to be m more radical and continuously radical after the Boston Tea Party. The Tea Party is remembered as a one and done. We destroyed this and the problem solved. But the problem is it wasn't done. There was still undestroyed tea there. And it had the risk of being, unique risk of being consumed as compared to many other colonies. And therefore, they needed to keep the population stirred up. So all these controversies that come out in early 74 about judges' salaries being drawn from the Customs Administration, these are trumped up controversies basically to keep people riled up and concerned to keep maybe keep judges from uh, being involved in the courts uh, uh, and so forth as well. But this is a way to keep the tea out, to keep the tea merchants that are handling it out of town as well as best as possible, chase them away from town so they can't land the tea. Um, and then notably, there is almost no discussion of the tea from the William. It just sort of, it's mentioned in a newspaper item or two and then it just disappears. I, w I wouldn't say it's a cover up, it's just a polite and thoughtful decision never to talk about it again. And then because it's not talked about, other colonies start to forget about it. Now, Boston remembers it though, and it's threatening Boston throughout the year. And so remembering the triumph of the three tea ships is really important because it covers up the failure about the fourth tea ship, right? But in fact, in reality, it's this hammer and anvil dynamic where it is the, the violence of the three tea ships that, that causes such a, a response from England and from the British government, but it is the, that fourth cargo that's here that makes it impossible for uh, colonists in Boston to accept the Port Act. The Port Act said you have to pay for the tea and allow normal trade to continue. Well, that would mean allowing the tea from the William to get sold. And so basically, colonists realize, oh, we could just keep, if we don't pay for the tea from the first three cargoes, then the British government will keep the tea from the William out of Boston for us by just keeping the port closed. And then we can say we're victims. And so this becomes a much more convenient, politically useful narrative. And that's the narrative that's going on by the second half of 1774. So when we begin to write and tell stories about it, the Williams tea disappears entirely because, well, I mean, it took 250 years to figure out what happened to it, for, because no one in the Patriot movement had anything more to do with it. None of the records they kept talking about it. None of the records from the consignees or the merchants mention it either. So it's just sort of disappears from the story. But it's that impact between those two that are really driving events. That's fascinating. So um, I think the traditional narrative of the aftermath of the Tea Party is destruction of the tea provokes an overreaction on the part of Parliament and the ministry. Um, the not only the Port Act, but the Massachusetts Government Act, the abrogation of representative government, um, that is what tips the, the town and the province of Massachusetts into open rebellion, ultimately. You're saying um, that a, a missed piece of the puzzle is the, the lingering concern about how to ensure that that additional cargo of tea is not brought into town and sold and uh, the whole works um, be scuttled in that way. Right, because if you imagine, first, you've got, if you're in the position of the Boston Committee of Correspondence, the respectable half of the Patriot Movement that's writing to other towns and other colonies, first you've got the problem of it looks bad because your Tea Party is violent and other people aren't too happy with it. Then imagine if you also had the problem of despite the excess of violence, people still drank the darn tea, right? This would be completely cratering to your political legitimacy at a time when the Boston Committee is still functioning as the central node that's connecting the other committees together. So the South Carolinians are not writing so much to New York and Philadelphia. They're writing to Boston. And the Philadelphians are writing to Boston. And the Connecticuters are writing to Boston. They're not writing to each other yet. They're not 
that comes with the formation of Congress and the creation of these new bonds. So there's this moment between the Tea Party and the seating of the First Continental Congress where Boston is uniquely this communications node. And if they were then embarrassed by being, as they had been four years earlier, a complete failure on the tea non-consumption, non-importation front, this would corrode the legitimacy of any claim that uh, uh, Boston shouldn't pay for the tea to get the Port Act open, which would be the simplest solution to the whole problem. And that, in fact, paying for the tea was one of the things that Congress took up as a potential response to all of this and could well have been a step forward. You've given us so much to think about here. Um, and there, I know there's plenty more that we could, um, that we could uh, talk about in the book, but I want to be respectful of our audience here and make sure that we s reserve a little bit of time for any questions that you all may have. So, um, Emily, uh, who opened the program, has a microphone. Since we are uh, uh, recording, please make sure that if you have a question, you raise your hand and wait until Emily brings you the microphone. Um, those of you who are watching this uh, live through GBH Forum Network, if you submit questions, um, there's an opportunity for us also to capture those, and, uh, and Emily can read them for, uh, for James. Uh, yep, it looks like we have a question already from our remote viewers, so I will read that as it's coming in here, and, I, and then I see we have a, someone in person here with a question. So, uh, from our, one of our GBH viewers, the question is, in addition of this wonderful commodity history that you've contributed, what other trends are emerging in the study of colonial and revolutionary consumer history? or American consumer history broadly? Mm. So American, this story of consumer history in this period has been long been fraught by this debate about whether there was this consumer revolution, this big growth in, in consumption. It's a very unresolved debate and I daren't stake a claim. Uh, um, but I, I think one of, the, uh, one of the big trends that's going on is our ability to use consumer history to talk about average everyday people, right? And, and so there has long been an, an old-fashioned trend in American history to talk about the contributions of everyday people and their contributions to events like the American Revolution. And consumer history, material culture, is a great way to get at exactly that, right? To get at the material world of everyday people and how they contributed. And that seems to me like the biggest er trend of this uh, material history. Got it, got it, thank you. And I saw a hand here. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the connection between um, uh, your evaluation of the Tea Part, uh, the Tea Boycott, as a tactic uh, before armed revolt actually happened, uh, to the Montgomery bus uh, boycott. And one of the things I'm curious about is um, how much strategy the uh, the revolutionaries or the Patriots, however we define them, took to defining their boycott because the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott, was, it was very successful and one of its defining things is that people needed to see people suffering. That when people took the choice not to get on the bu bus, they had to walk or they had to pull together to do right. So they couldn't just go home and hide what they, what they were doing. And so the, Dr. King and Bayard Rustin, who was the main organizer of it, actually strategized that they really wanted people to be seen having to take this stand. And was that a tactic that ever kind of was part of the tea boycott? Or were there other variations? Because in a way, the way you're depicting it, at least from what I'm hearing, I haven't read the book yet, it seemed like it was more of a, um, you know, it wasn't a really thought out tactic of how to make a boycott work. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I would say there's three pieces that, made, that, that make the Montgomery boycott especially distinctive to what's going on here. One is the local element that we mentioned already. Now that's obviously related to what you mentioned, which is the visibility of it, right? And a visibility where you're, you're, you're seeing people walking down the road or ride sharing 
and it's visible and an everyday thing. So that's not just, all, it's not only seeing people suffer, but it's also seeing people, um, uh, in, it's like watching people on a picket line, right? You're seeing people in action opposing the, the bus, right? But the third element is, is that like black ridership was a really big part of, of the bus company's business and they couldn't keep the business going without black riders, at least not for more than about a year. So that's very different from the East India Company, which doesn't need North American consumers at all. Actually, it's just fine without North American consumers. And there's this fantasy in talking about the American Revolution and the boycotts that American consumers are often, were often imagined to be, by contemporary Americans, to be way more important than they were. The British population outnumbered the North American population four to one. It, there were also uh, many regions of North America that were less, had less wealth and less annual income than many regions of Britain, which of course also had a lot of class differences within it. But British consumers could consume more per capita. They consumed more tea per capita than North American consumers, not because they liked tea more, but because they were richer. So uh, the whole logic of we will not consume tea and British goods is like, well, so what? You're not the big, you're not the main market. It's uh, and so the other thing they boycott is British manufactured products, about a little more than a third of what's imported into North America at the, before the boycott is British manufactured cloth. Um, but the, the mills in, in Manchester and Birmingham, like, it's a shame to lose the American business, but they don't really need it. They can continue selling to British consumers just fine, to Irish consumers as well. And about the strategy, so the whole boycott is, becomes like so many boycotts, it becomes more about organizing internally for your movement than it really does about affecting change. So it unites people together. People can see each other agreeing to this. One of the other things they often do with the boycott is send relief to Boston in the Port Act. So cities like Charleston, South Carolina will send rice and people will, drovers will be driving their sheep to Boston to feed the population and that can be seen as it's being delivered, right? And that has meaning. And in Boston's committee is very thoughtful and sends thank you notes to all of the cities that contribute food and it's run in all the local newspapers. Thank you for your contributions. That makes a real sense of common cause between people, as does the boycotting. Um, but the boycott has no impact economically on Britain. It's themed or it's framed as though it's going to affect the 1774 parliamentary election, but that happened before the boycott took effect. So the election was over, you couldn't really affect it. And everyone responded to the boycott the same way. They said, oh no, there's gonna be another boycott. Quick, let's stock up extra on things. And so they bought all extra supplies like everybody did with COVID, right? They stocked up on, on junk and then, well, the merchants were fine. They had just sold more than they normally would in a year because the, everyone bought up their 1775 supplies early. So it had very little effect on the British economy. And so this logic of we'll use the North American economy to affect the British economy, to affect British politics, just completely fell apart, if there even was a real logic there. Can I just ask a, a just a follow up, a, just to invite you to clarify. So um, I think I hear you saying as a economic strategy, yeah. the, the boycott and the prohibition fail. Right. Yep. They're, they're really not exerting enough. Uh, they're not effective enough to exert pressure, political pressure. Uh, but as a, as a mechanism for, for developing commitment on the part of the individual to a collective cause, they're fabulous. they may have been yeah. successful. Um, so question for you, are there sources from the time period where that observation is made, or is this an insight that we have as historians looking back that may not have been clear at the time? I don't think anyone at the time they were bringing in the, the, the association and its, its bans on trade with Britain was really clear on how things were gonna play out. Uh, there was a sense that maybe this ability to have economic impact on Britain was potentially limited and perhaps local things would matter more. But the, the way local politics played out, one of the tricks with the, the, the boycott that Congress puts out is framed in its Continental Association is the association completely bypasses the colonies. It says Congress asks the local towns or, or parishes or counties, whatever, whatever organization you have in your colony, to go implement this on their own. And it's completely open-ended. And so 
it allows for a lot of local variation as Virginia politics or Georgia politics or, North, or New Hampshire politics proceeds in very, very different ways. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? Yes, another question over here. Thank you very much. Could you just comment a little bit on the, um, the concept of what I think you call the taxless tea and the, the Dutch tea, the, mm -hmm. the smuggle tea, whatever the word's correct word is, and its relationship to the boycott, and whether you feel at all there was any conspiracy to stop that taxed tea coming in because those people who were part of the Patriot cause were also interested in, in receiving the revenue from taxless tea. Wait, I lost you at the end. I, I, the, the, the concept of the conspiracy theory, you know, as, as such that suggests that Hancock and others were interested in making sure that the British tea didn't arrive in order, and was unloaded in order that he could sell and be, uh, receive the benefit from Dutch tea and other teas that were uh, being well, That's used. not a conspiracy theory. That's a mainstream historical argument. Uh, uh, but secondly, uh, on your use of conspiracy, it's a very good word because the North American radical movement was a conspiracy. Like, that's the main conspiracy going on. That is the main political conspiracy. It's a seditious criminal conspiracy with a paramilitary terrorist wing. Um, and it, it, that's uncomfortable to think about a lot of times that way, but that's the main conspiracy that's going on. The, the money-making part of it is a bit on the side, but you know, that's, it's more useful. Lots of people in the Patriot movement weren't merchants, right? Most of them weren't merchants. So what you really have is merchants and businessmen who see an opportunity and will take advantage of it. John Hancock imported and sold um, lots of undutied smuggled tea from the Netherlands. He also imported and sold lots of duty tax tea from Britain. So he was, um, like any good merchant or any good politician, a liar, a cheat, and a hypocrite. Um, so I think that makes him a, a great American by default, right? He diversified his business lines. Oh, yes, yes, of course, <laughs> yes. All right, I saw another hand over here. Hello, this is a very interesting presentation, thank you. Um, you mentioned that as a result of the Tea Party, there was this overreaction by Britain, and then that ultimately caused the Massachusetts population to decide to go in support of the revolution. So I'm wondering now, have you noticed in any of your research what, were, what was the goal, the end game, for the organizers of the Tea Party? Was that really the end goal, that they saw that happening, or was it just to inflict economic damage by saying that, A, you don't get the tax money, and B, you don't get the revenue because the, the East India Tea Company was a British mm -hmm. crown thing? Or was it just to say, you know, you know, we don't want it, or was it just simply one of these things that popped up with no real end game in mind, like the Rodney King riots or something like that, where people just hadn't... I don't think there was an end game. Now, mm -hmm. I would say, caution, the East India Company was not a crown thing. It, it um, was a separate business. It did, it was licensed by the crown, and it paid taxes to the crown, um, but it was a separate uh, uh, line. But yeah, there was, I don't see there was any clear long-term plan. There was the short-term problem of if the tea isn't destroyed, uh, they clearly preferred to just get it sent back to England. That was their preferred outcome. But uh, the, my Governor Hutchinson, the consignees, the customs officers, they all knew that this was a pressure point to put on the Patriots and to say, we won't, we won't let you send it back. And the Patriots, because if you think about it, the, the tea ships, the, the tea party, it's weird, the tea ships didn't all arrive at the same time. The first three arrived st in a staggered order. And so this means that the 20-day countdown only applied to the Dartmouth. The, the Eleanor had several more days to go, and the Beaver had an, another week after that before its 20 days would be over. And so what everyone's thinking is, what we do about the Dartmouth is going to define what we can do about the Eleanor. So if you, if the if Hutchinson had let the Dartmouth leave, then he would have no ground to stand on for not letting the Eleanor go. And if Patriots let the tea from the Dartmouth be landed, they would have no ground to stand on for preventing the Eleanor's tea from being landed as well. So they were both stuck in this game of chicken 
about the 20-day deadline on the Eleanor, and that's really all they were focusing on, thinking they could basically bluffing each other into trying to win everything. If you win on the, if you win on the Dartmouth, the Eleanor and the Beaver will fall in line. And that was, I think, as far as it went. Any more questions from our audience here? Oh, let me go over here one moment. Hello, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's been very interesting. Um, in regards to your chapter on the T sex, mm -hmm. in your research, did you find any instances of women gaining any sort of political agency during this time, especially with the tea being boycotted as well as some of the British manufacturing where women were making their own clothes, things like that, um, more so than going outside of their own domestic sphere, I think, is what I'm thinking about in terms of political agency. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. I think the, the most striking place where I see consistent running political, political engagement by women is in South Carolina, where you have women writing, or maybe, I assume they're women, although it's possible these are men writing under female pseudonyms, you never really know, uh, writing about uh, a boycotting tea and the political organization and the need for women to, to support their fellow Englishmen, that they refer to their husbands as Englishmen in this period, uh, uh, in this boycott movement. Um, so worth noting the, the limit of American nationalism there. Um, however, I would caution on that. I'm a suspicious of that because if the end result of that is that women are choosing to not, or not to buy woven cloth from the shop and instead choosing to weave it at home, that's a very funny kind of political agency that says I politically choose to a way for women to have agency outside the home because it's they are politically choosing to go back home and do more housework. That, that is interesting and we tend to write that as a sort of a women's empowerment storyline and I find that an interesting women's empowerment storyline. Women are empowering themselves to do more domestic chores. That's, but, yeah, so, but again, it may well be true, right? It may, it may well make sense. People tell themselves all sorts of things. It doesn't have to make sense just because they told themselves it. Well, that is all of the time that we have this evening. So I want to thank our audience for being here. I want to thank our, uh, the audience that's joining us um, via the forum network for being with us this evening. I want to thank C-SPAN for being here to, uh, to film this program as well. And I want to make sure uh, that I invite you all to join me in thanking Dr. Fichter for being here with us. Thank, thank you. you.